Bonjour. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. James, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I hear you. Good. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est mon plaisir de vous accueillir à notre troisième atelier sur oui, la résilience du secteur d'électricité. Et uh, je vais continuer en anglais, et, mais vous pouvez écouter dans anglais ou français en choisissant uh, votre langue préférée avec le bouton en, en bas de l'écran. Uh, so, Thank you everyone for joining. I, I believe we're, we've, uh, we've all met, uh, so we can get right into the material today, but thank you so much for joining. We're excited to talk about vulnerabilities and, and continue our work here. James, I'll pass it over to you. Yes, hello again. Great to see you all. Thanks for joining uh, on this Friday. I think I think everybody on this has been here before, but again, James Ellsworth. I'm a mechanical engineer and resilience researcher at the De Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, we also have Sally Williams and Chrissy Scarpiti on the line. Uh, so next slide. Jean Philippe, uh, project manager, Cell Energy Cell. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and for today, we'll, I, I think we'll, we all, we all know each other so we can skip introductions um, and get right to the content. So today, uh, this is workshop three out of four. We'll be focusing on power sector vulnerabilities. And then next week, we will have a workshop on uh, power sector risks, solutions, and how you prioritize resilience actions. Next slide. So quickly to review from last time, um, threats, um, so you can back up the slide, I think, yeah. So a threat, our definition is anything that can damage, destroy, or disrupt the power sector. We talked about how they could be natural, technological, or human caused, and typically, you think of threats as things that are not within the control of power system planners and opportunities. There are things that happen to you rather than something you can control. Uh, the graph on the right here shows, um, shows different kinds of things that have caused some outages on a power sector. Uh, that outage would actually be the impact of a threat, but here you see things like trees, storms, uh, equipment that may be a threat, that may be a vulnerability, as we'll talk about. Um, uh, and squirrels always shows up on this uh, on these graphs. I don't think there are squirrels in Haiti. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I'm sure there's other types of animals uh, and rodents that uh, that can cause damage and chew through power lines and uh, and whatnot. So, but it's it's amazing if you look up uh, the power outage causes. Squirrels are always very high up. Uh, so we talked about uh, threats and identified some threats uh, that, uh, to Haiti's power sector last time. Uh, and then after that, we talked about how you might score these threats. Uh, and so you can advance the slide, Sally. Yep. And there's different ways to do this. Uh, this is what we showed last time. You score the threats based on the likelihood that they will happen. Uh, and so this is one, one scale from one to 10. How likely is it that this event will occur? Uh, from one where it's almost certain not to occur to 10 where it's almost certain to occur. Uh, and we talked about a lot of threats. Uh, I think we talked about things like cyclones uh, and looking at this scoring system, to say for cyclones, giving them a threat score, you can look at, you know, historically, how often have they happened? You know, how how many have, have there been over time? Uh, but you also want to think about uh, how often they're going to happen in the future. Since there's a, a couple of 
comment in the chat that they're not uh the sound isn't coming through. Uh, uh, okay. Are other folks having challenges hearing or No sound. Okay. Can you you can hear me, right? Yeah, James, we can hear yeah. you fine. Maybe okay, it's, it's working maybe it's a, maybe you just have to select the right language for interpretation, or maybe it's the, an audio. Okay, so two people can't hear. Two people can. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what to do about that. I think you're right, James. I think yeah. perhaps we just make sure at the bottom, you can choose French or English. Um, and sometimes if you don't choose one of those, there can be challenges, but let us know. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I can hear now. Okay. Then we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. 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 I okay. think that's pretty much everyone. Looks like it's back on. Looks, Let's looks continue, like it. But please, yeah, let us know if uh, if that's an issue again. Thank you. Yep. Let us know if that's an issue or if there's any other questions. Uh, please put them in the chat. Thanks. Uh, so here we have a list of some of the threats that uh, that you all brought up last time. Uh, some of them are natural, some of them are technological, and some of them are human-caused threats. Uh, I was mentioning cyclones before, looking at historically how often they've occurred, but also thinking about the future. Maybe they'll occur more often in the future. Maybe the, the strength of the cyclone will be more in the future. Maybe it'll come with, with more or less rain. Uh, you can you can get more specific with some of these if you wanted to. If you wanted to do, say, you know, look at category four or five cyclones for, as one threat, and maybe a category one cyclone as a different threat, maybe they'll have different impacts. Uh, so if, um, yeah, so if you're actually going through through this process uh, and meeting in a group and having discussions about all of these, uh, you can you can talk about little differences like that and actually actually get data to try to base your scores on. Uh, but for this exercise, you know, we don't have, we don't have specific data. We don't have um, time to do that. We'll just kind of look at these and talk about our our best guess. Uh, and we can actually do that now for some of these. Uh, so we'll kind of we'll look through these threats, and um, from, you can type in the chat from one to ten what do you think the likelihood of this threat happening is. Uh, so we'll start with cyclones. Uh, how how likely do you think it is that a cyclone will occur? Like from a scale from one to ten. I guess the other aspect of this is you have to think um, think about over what time frame. Uh, what time frame are you, are you thinking? Right. We're talking about planning for your power sector. You know, planning power plants that might last for thirty year more years transmission infrastructure that'll have a long lifetime too. So you have to think over the lifetime uh, of these parts of your power sector, how likely how likely are they to happen? So we've got a, a three and a four in the chat. The four would kind of be possible, but more likely not to occur. Feel free to type any other any other numbers. Type some type numbers in the chat on Zoom, or if or you can just say them if you want to come off mute and say your input. We've got another three. Okay. Yeah. What about? Uh, we'll do. We'll just go through a maybe five of these. Uh, so the next one, 
Next one, landslides. What is the uh, probability of a landslide occurring? Yeah, we can go back to we can go back to the scale on the previous slide. So we, these are our scores from one to ten. Uh, where one is rare, and ten is almost definitely going to occur. So. I know it's Friday. It's Friday, but let's get some class participation here. It's not a right answer, uh, and this is, I mean, especially you know, without data, we don't know exactly how how likely they are, yeah, to occur. But this is um, meant to get some input from everybody and also to uh, create some discussion. Um, so yeah, we are doing a very high level overview of this process of this process. If you were actually all together you know, independently and do a power sector planning process all sitting in a room, uh, you could probably come up with your own in scores and debate what you think you should actually, what the actual score should be for this. Okay, so we have a, yeah, a three and a one. We also had a 10 come in for cyclones. Another three for landslides. There we go. That's that's what we're looking for. Um, let's pick uh, let's pick another one. What about um, to do fuel? Do we do the next one? Fuel shortages and price increases. That's what somebody who's already one ahead of me and put a seven in the chat for that. We had another. Yeah, maybe another 10 come in for hurricanes, or maybe that's the same 10. Um, a couple, or one seven for, for fuel shortage shortages and price increases. Um, okay, seven and eight. And then we'll do one, do one more. What about, um, or maybe two roadblocks and protests? Or someone's got a, someone's got a nine for aging infrastructure and tools. <laughs> we can might as well might as well throw that in there. Car accidents. We have a five. The roadblocks, we've got an eight. And a seven, another seven for the roadblocks. Okay, got a six for car accidents. Four for floods, eight for road closure, or that's, that's just the translation. I think. All right, we can, all right, that's great. Yeah, so, all right, here we go. That's good. Starting to get some, starting to get some action in the chat now. That's good to see. Uh, yeah, keep them coming. Feel free to keep typing them in the chat. Um, before our next, we'll, we will actually use these in our in our next workshop when we look at uh, comparing the. Well, we'll use them in the next workshop to help prioritize uh, the biggest risks to the power system. So feel free to keep typing them. But for now, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Yes, we wanted to address one question that we had in the last workshop about uh, outage times and recovery times. 
Uh, and I think uh, it's a tough question to answer. We showed that graph of power going out after an event, power being out for a little bit and then recovering, and that there's some amount of time that that takes to happen. Uh, how often is, is or how long is normal to be without power and, and how do you measure that? Uh, the short answer is that it varies a lot. Um, there's a lot of difference. Uh, and it's based on you know what causes the outage and how resilient the power grid is and wherever the outage happened within the power grid. Uh, but there are a couple different metrics that utilities typically track. Uh, some of those are this system average interruption duration index. Uh, there's the system average interruption frequency index and then the customer average interruption duration index uh, to measure how, how often and for how long the power goes out. Uh, the system side can measure it from the you know, power sector operator and the customer side looks at the, the customer outages, the, the average outages for a specific customer. Uh, those are, these are all traditional metrics that utilities use. Um, Typically, they're used to track reliability rather than resilience, but they can kind of they can be used for both. Uh, and if you look at this bottom chart here, the darker blue is more about reliability. Looking at without major events, um, this is the average duration of power outage uh, in the United States uh, in hours per customer. So they're about two hours per outage on average without major events. Uh, now, when you start looking at the light blue, that's more, uh, more looking at resilience and thinking about how resilience might impact the length of time of these interruptions. And you see it, it varies a lot. It also looks like it's increasing over time, at least in this 2013 to 2021 uh, timescale. Uh, and then on the right, we can see, you know, state by state within the United States, there is a big difference too in how uh, the average amount of time that customers are without power uh, from from Florida at the top, which may be surprising because you think Florida might get a lot of hurricanes, um, all the way down to California on the bottom. And California's not sure why California is the longest. Maybe um, maybe a lot of wildfire related outages that take a long time to restore. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, Maine, the second on the list, is, is is pretty rural, so there might be a lot of people that are that live pretty far away. Um, but again, it varies a lot, and this shows just you know, not necessarily, it's not necessarily how vulnerable you are to threats, but it's how strong and resilient your power grid is that might actually determine how long your power outage is. Uh, a couple examples on the next few slides. Uh, the first one is in Florida. And it's after two hurricanes, Hurricane Irma in 2017 and Wilma in, in 2005. And uh, the slide is just in English, sorry. But on the x-axis, we have the number of days after landfall. Uh, and on the y-axis on the left, we have the, uh, the percentage of customers without power. Uh, and so here. You know, one hurricane had almost 40% of people without power, another one up to 60%, but most, most of them, maybe 90% of them had power back after nine days or so. But that also varies a lot. On the next slide, uh, we're looking at Puerto Rico. And we have some of two of the same hurricanes we looked at on the last slide in gray. Uh, and after those two hurricanes, you know, 100% of the power was restored. It's hard to tell. It looks like 10 to 20 days. Um, but then in red, we have Hurricane Maria. And power wasn't restored after Hurricane Maria for months and months and months for some people. Uh, you know, it took almost two months to get 50% of, of Puerto Rico back online and, and almost you know, five or six months for other places on the line. And a lot of that's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, first is that Hurricane Irma came just a few weeks before Hurricane Maria. So it wasn't, it was not an isolated event. 
Hurricane Irma dumped a lot of rain and saturated the ground. Uh, and so Hurricane Maria then caused a lot more damage uh, as a result. So you have what you might call compounding threats of two different events. Uh, it's also, there's a lot of difficulties in actually delivering equipment back to the island. You know, delivering all the, you know, they needed, they needed 60,000 poles for their distribution system and thousands of transformers uh, and getting all of that to the island and getting workers to install it. It took a long time, uh, especially, you know, Puerto Rico, like Haiti, has a lot of mountainous terrain that's difficult to navigate. Uh, but again, uh, the time to restoration varies a lot. That's, that's another theme here. Uh, one more example on the next slide uh, before we get to the main stuff in this workshop. Uh, I really like this example here showing the benefits of a more resilient grid compared to a less resilient grid. Uh, we're looking at two hurricanes here uh, in this the table on the left, Hurricane Ian in Florida in 2022 and Hurricane Ida in Louisiana in 2021. They both had similar wind speeds, 150 miles per hour. Uh, they both had large power outages. Actually, Hurricane Ian uh, had even more power outages, uh, 2.5 million people without power. They had similar storm surges. Uh, but some big differences started showing up in the actual amount of damage. Florida had very little transmission damage compared to Louisiana, where they had many uh, transmission structures destroyed or damaged. Uh, and if you look at the recovery time, within two days, 75% of the outages in Florida were back online and those customers had power. By 10 days in Louisiana, only 50% you know, of people were back online. Uh, and that's because uh, after previous hurricanes had caused damage in Florida, specifically Hurricane Michael, uh, the utility there had developed, they went through kind of this resilience exercise and developed uh, a comprehensive resilience plan. They invested in you know, stronger transmission and distribution poles. They buried power lines underground. Uh, they took all their substations and made sure that they were not in areas that could flood. Uh, and if they were, they, they moved them uphill, basically. Uh, and they had also, they also upgraded their building codes to make sure the the actual buildings uh, were, very, were resilient to, to hurricanes and, and to other kinds of threats. Um, and the other thing is interesting is they, they uh, had reached an agreement with, with utilities outside of the state uh, to have a plan that if a hurricane did hit Florida, they would be able to mobilize and bring in workers from elsewhere really quickly to help with the restoration. So uh, all of that is just to show, you know, the value in having a resilience plan and implementing some solutions, uh, it, can make a, it can make a huge difference. Um, okay, uh, any, any questions or comments on these? Okay. Uh, we'll go to the next slide and get into vulnerabilities then. Uh, so our key messages today uh, that we'll repeat a couple times, uh, we're going to place power sector vulnerabilities into two categories, infrastructure and processes. Uh, and that, or infrastructure and process vulnerabilities. And the point here is that we need to consider both types of vulnerabilities when we are assessing resilience. Uh, I'm an engineer. I know a lot of you on the line are engineers. My, my mind immediately goes to infrastructure and technical problems, um, but it's, you really have to focus on these process vulnerabilities as well. Those infrastructure vulnerabilities, uh, sometimes they're easy to address because we can think of a solution. We know what the solution is, but sometimes that solution is very expensive. Uh, these process vulnerabilities, they tend to be more difficult uh, but maybe the fixes aren't quite as expensive. They could involve things like uh, training people or development of codes and standards. All right, so next slide. 
what are uh, officially, what's our official definition of vulnerabilities? Uh, they are weaknesses within infrastructure, processes, or systems that can be modified and mitigated to either prevent a disruption or lessen the impact of a disruption. Typically, threats are things you cannot control. Vulnerabilities are things you can control. Sometimes it's not always so clear and not always so black and white what's a threat and what's a vulnerability, like we, like we talked about last time. Uh, but in general, if you, yeah, if, if you are all sitting in a room doing a resilience planning process, coming up with threats and vulnerabilities, you can have that discussion and decide what you think is a threat and what is a vulnerability. So to emphasize that point a little more um, on the next slide, one example uh, is that you'll have, well, here's an example, you have a threat that might impact your power system and then expose some vulnerability. So here we have lightning as a threat and it can have several stages of impact. First, the lightning strikes the pole. Uh, second, maybe that lightning damages a pole. And then the final result of that is that you might have a power outage for your customers. The vulnerability there would be that there is one vulnerability could be that there's a lack of lightning protection on your transmission and distribution equipment. So if you address that vulnerability and have lightning protection on your transmission and distribution equipment, when that lightning strikes the pole, maybe there will not be damage to the poles, you will not have that impact, and then your power stays on because you would address that vulnerability in your power system. Just want to make this point again, threats and impacts can expose vulnerabilities. So you have a threat, a threat can strike, can strike your power system, it will have an impact, and, and maybe that will expose a vulnerability. Okay, next slide. So I talked about breaking up vulnerabilities into infrastructure vulnerabilities and systems or process vulnerabilities. Uh, it's one way to do it just to help you think about it and make sure that you are considering all these different types of vulnerabilities. Uh, but under infrastructure, we have vulnerabilities in generation, transmission, distribution, or even on the customer and customer equipment side. And then systems and process vulnerabilities include things like operations, workforce, planning, and financial vulnerabilities. And we'll go into all of these in a little more detail. Oh, and the next slide, yeah, so we grouped them into uh, infrastructure and process vulnerabilities. Uh, some people like to group them into vulnerabilities based on the types of threats. So there's different ways you can group them. Whatever is best for you is fine. Uh, here we have, you know, we have we talked about natural threats. So you could have a, a vulnerability that's exposed by a natural threat. Uh, maybe the substations at the Florida utility were in a location that were prone to flooding. Uh, so that was a vulnerability that they addressed. Uh, technological vulnerabilities could include, you know, cybersecurity defenses or, you know, lack, lack of backup systems, or maybe you have a single point of failure. Human vulnerabilities uh, could have to do with your workforce, whether there's enough workforce or if they're properly trained for the tasks they have to complete. Uh, and then there's lots of others, lots of others you could consider as well. Okay, so infrastructure vulnerabilities, we'll go into a little more detail and provide some examples uh, here and just keep these examples in mind. I will ask you later uh, to type in the chat some, some examples of vulnerabilities that you think exists on Haiti's power system or power systems. Uh, and so we'll go through some examples here, but keep these things in your mind or, jot, or write some down or uh, to save for later. So first we'll talk about generation. Um, all sorts of vulnerabilities can exist for, for generation infrastructure. I'll give a couple example, examples here. 
we have a picture of this, um, this hydro facility here, a hydropower facility, uh, aging in infrastructure. There's been a lot of countries that have had old hydro dams that have collapsed, uh, that have caused flooding downstream, that have caused power outages. Um, I know there's a lot of hydropower in Haiti that could be could definitely be a vulnerability that you're experiencing. Uh, insufficient cooling water supply or temperature for thermal power plants uh, needing to you know to cool water before you return it to rivers and streams. I know this was an issue in France recently. Uh, France France gets about I think it's about two thirds of its generation from nuclear power, and due to climate change. A lot of the, the rivers that they took water from to, um, to, cool, to cool their plants were actually too hot, uh, too hot to, to where they couldn't return the water back to the river afterwards. So they had to shut down plants, shut down some of their nuclear plants because of that, and then had a generation shortage as a result. Uh, fuel supply uncertainties. Uh, this is an interesting one. I know we, we mentioned something very similar when we were talking about threats a while ago. And so I do think this is something that, depending on how you look at it, you could consider it a threat maybe, or maybe a vulnerability. Um, and if you're trying to decide, I guess you, you can ask yourselves, you know, is this something you can change or not? Um, I think here, I think here, you know, you could consider either one. But if you're looking at it as a vulnerability, uh, maybe you think, you know, diesel fuel shipments don't arrive to your ports, so you can't you can't run some of the diesel power plants. You can't generate enough power for people, and you get power outages as a result. Maybe you have to implement rolling blackouts. Um, I guess on one hand, you could say, hey, this is a threat. It's not my fault that the diesel ship didn't come. Uh, but on the other hand, you can say, well. Maybe if you had more local resources providing power, if you had more solar or wind or hydropower, uh, then you maybe could have avoided or decreased this risk that the ship wouldn't come and deliver fuel. So from that perspective, you can look at it as a vulnerability where you know the weakness in your power system is that you're relying on these diesel shipments. So you have a, a high reliance on diesel coming. Uh, but there is something that you could do so you could rely on them less. Um, okay, a couple other examples there, um, undersizing capacity and, uh, and supply chain issues as well. But we can move on to the next, next part of infrastructure vulnerabilities here, looking at your transmission system. Um, and when, you know, a lot of times when you have transmission lines go down, that's when you have these you know, long-term and widespread outages. Uh, we saw that in that graph I showed from uh, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Uh, maybe the design or the age of the infrastructure leaves it susceptible to failure. Um, maybe you have bottlenecks in your transmission system where your load Maybe when you built your transmission system, your load was smaller, uh, and then the amount of number of customers or the amount of electricity they're using has increased, so you're you're not as able to to send as much power as you need down the transmission lines. Uh, with resilience, we talk a lot about lack of redundant lines. If you have only one set of transmission lines going from the power plant out to a certain region, uh, then if something happens to those power lines, then the whole region can be out without power. Okay, um, and then supply chain also, supply chain comes up more and more. Uh, and that can be a, a vulnerability for, for everything, not being able to get replacement parts for, for repairs and restoration. Okay, so then moving to the, uh, moving to the distribution system. Uh, a lot of the, some of the same issues that you have in transmission, uh, maybe it's just the design that's susceptible to failure. Um, and it's something, maybe it's something that can be improved. I was, you know, I was in Guam, an island in the Pacific recently, and I was, I was impressed that their, their utility had replaced almost all of the distribution poles on the island with concrete poles. You go around the whole island and it's, um, 
it's all concrete poles. They had, I was there after a hurricane uh, looking at the damage and, and no, no damage at all to any of their poles. It was really, uh, it was really impressive. But then going back to Puerto Rico, uh, I've heard, you know, one of the reasons, one of many reasons that power was out so long after Hurricane Maria was that a lot of the poles had been overloaded. Uh, you know, they're designed to have just, you know, a certain amount of equipment up there. But then, you know, as, you know, cellular and internet communications spread throughout the island, a lot of those companies were just adding more and more of their equipment to the top of the poles. And so they were actually getting really heavy at the top. So when the storm came through, uh, you know, they weren't supposed to have that much weight up at the top of the poles and they were a little top heavy and were knocked over, you know, more easily from Hurricane Maria. And so there was a a lot more widespread outage because of that. Um, that could be considered a design thing, that could be considered planning, but uh, the infrastructure was not designed to hold the loads that were ultimately put on it. Um, yeah, we've always got veg potential veg sorry, vegetation interactions. Um, it's hard to keep up with you know, tree trimming and overgrowth, especially in island, uh, in island places. Uh, aging infrastructure, of course, um, and uh, lack of redundancy or some other good examples. And of course, supply chains going to show up throughout uh, throughout all of this. Okay, then the last slide in this infrastructure vulnerability se se section, sorry, uh, is about uh, kind of the customer side of this. And there's different, all sorts of different things that customers can do. Uh, People do all sorts of crazy things with power, try to hook up, you know, hook up all sorts of equipment or, or run huge electric loads that might uh, that might trip the system or cause cause local outages. I suppose um, unauthorized self generation. People trying to generate their own power, having unpredictable loads that might spike or or drop quickly, um, and then I know informal or unauthorized connections. Um, one of my favorite power sector terms is non-technical losses uh, for this, but uh, that's, you know, it, it's a big issue in that it can be, you know, a lot of times those those unauthorized connections, sure, uh, it's a not collecting revenue for the utility, but it can also cause a lot of, uh, you know, uncertainty and makes it hard to predict how much, uh, how much power demand you have. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see a comment in the chat about financial vulnerabilities, and we have a slide on that coming up. So maybe I'll maybe we'll address that. Uh, we'll address that when we get to that slide. But if there's any other uh, any other questions or comments on on anything we've talked about so far, maybe on the infrastructure side of it, particularly. If not, let's. Uh, Let's continue, and I'll I'll probably go through these a little bit a little bit faster, uh, so we can get to the activity and, and hear more of your input. Uh, so, as opposed to the infrastructure um, infrastructure vulnerabilities that we said are more technical in nature, they're sometimes easier to come up with solutions for, but maybe more expensive. Uh, we can look at these process uh, these process vulnerabilities here uh, that might be tougher to find solutions for, tougher to get people to agree on solutions for as well. Uh, the first type is uh, has to do with system operations. Um, and this is kind of based in your you know, utility headquarters. How do you actually operate your power grids? Um, and certain vulnerabilities related to that can be lim limited operational flexibility. Uh, when we talk about operational flexibility, we're talking about uh, the ability of your power system uh, to respond to changes, whether that's a change in demand on the customer side or a change in generation. Uh, this is always something utilities have dealt with, but it's becoming more and more important, especially as you get more solar power and wind power on your grid. Uh, the outputs from solar and wind power can, uh, can vary more. And so you, know, you can have a spike or a decrease in the amount of solar power you're getting. As a grid operator, are you able to adjust to that? And are you able to keep providing power 
uh, as you have these these changes uh, these changes in generation. Um, limited generation forecasting uh, is the next one. Uh, the better you are able to predict how much generation you need and how much generation will be available to you, the better you are able to actually meet your load. Uh, looking at the actual operation centers themselves, do they have backup power supply? Like what if the power to your grid operations uh, center goes down? Cyber and physical security measures, that's going to be more and more and more important. Uh, at NREL, we do work with utilities uh, in a lot of places, but especially we have been focusing on utilities in the Caribbean uh, and a lot of other small utilities. And, and everyone we talk to uh, has been the subject of cyber attacks, some successful, some not, but they are affecting everyone. It's not just you know, big utilities. It's, um, I don't know if, I don't know if any, any of you have had uh, any cyber attacks uh, targeted you know, at, at EDH or anyone else, uh, or if, um, feel free to comment on it <laughs> if you have, but it, if, if you haven't yet, then I think it, it will definitely be something in the future and something you uh, want to prepare for. Uh, and then the last two bullet points, data and communication times are also, also important system operations considerations. Jeez, we have a question in the chat before you uh, move on too far. Pretty relevant question, maybe um, to use an idiom in English, uh, the elephant in the room. But uh, there's a question that says financial vulnerability, isn't that sort of like a domino effect that brings on 80% of all other vulnerabilities? Yeah, um, right. If you had enough money and time, you could probably solve most of these problems, right? Uh, so um, especially more money, uh, more people, more money, more time then you can solve everything. So like if you if you trace a lot of these vulnerabilities back far enough, um, maybe you come up, you realize that the ultimate vulnerability is, is that there's just not enough money to do things. Um, and a lot of times, yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely true. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, why you, when you go through an activity like we're outlining in these workshops, you, we're talking about you know all the threats that are out there. We're talking about all the vulnerabilities that are out there, and there's a lot. But then the final step that we'll do in the next workshop is uh, prioritizing those. It, it, first, sorry, first thinking about some solutions and prioritizing those um, based on what's most important and what's financially feasible. Uh, so that's definitely a key step in this. Um, and we'll also talk, I think in the next workshop, we'll also think about ways you can um, you can bring in more money for resilience upgrades to your power system. So we're planning on uh, showing you some resources of different aid organizations and funding that might be available specifically for, uh, for resilience. I don't have those examples. I don't have them, a slide on that right now, but next workshop will include some of those. Uh, any other comments on that question or any, or, uh, whoever wrote the question, if you want to have anything else to share on that. Sounds good then. Okay. Uh, another type of process vulnerability we can talk about is Workforce and human resources. I think this is uh, along with when you get down to it, along with financial vulnerabilities, this is the other big one. Uh, and it, it sure it could be related to supply chains. Can you actually get the equipment that you need, uh, or can you get you know workers in after after a disaster happens? Can you actually get enough people mobilized and out to to do the repair? Um, and then are they are your workers, do you have enough workers? Are they trained enough? Do they have time to do things beyond just you know, the bare minimum uh, or beyond just you know, their everyday tasks, I guess. So, um, and this is a big one that also, I guess you could say requires more money, right? If they have more money, you could do more training. You could hire more people uh, possibly. 
and I like this image. Uh, I like this uh, photo on the slide here because it maybe shows utility workers responding to an emergency. Uh, the emergency here, I guess, being that there's a cat on top of a telephone pole in California. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, planning, so like process vulnerabilities around planning. And so this includes resilience planning. It also includes emergency response planning, uh, making sure that you have a course of action if, you know, should a certain type of threat impact your power system. Uh, but then getting more specific, you know, have, have you done a resilience plan too? So have, have you done an emergency response plan? Do you have a resilient plan? And then next, uh, is that is that resilient plan actually incorporated into your bigger power system planning? Uh, do you have an IRP for your, util your utility and does that specifically address resilience? Uh, you also have you know, predictions for, um, you have to predict your load growth, do load forecasting, load and demand forecasting, uh, both on the generation and the demand side. That might be more of a traditional reliability exercise rather than specifically a resilience exercise, um, but it is uh, reliability is a is a component of resilience for sure. Um, codes and standards. Um, there's a lot you could go into on codes and standards. I mentioned building codes uh, in that example in Florida, how their utility uh, really implemented stricter building codes so that their structures were more resilient to you know to high winds and to flooding. Uh, but also codes for your power system equipment. Um, I do a lot of work with solar and making sure that the solar infrastructure itself is resilient to withstanding high winds and, uh, and driven rain and things like that. Uh, a lot of times that requires adopting additional codes beyond just the typical codes that people use. Um, planning, yeah, planning also making sure you have plans for your infrastructure upgrades. Uh, if you don't have good plans for infrastructure upgrades, they probably won't get upgraded. And then we lead to that aging infrastructure vulnerability that we've mentioned a few times. Uh, and then there's some just communication and coordination points here, making sure you know, you're not just, just planning for resilience within the power sector. Um, you're talking to your water and wastewater uh, agencies, uh, you're talking with telecommunications, agriculture, and all of these different sectors and agencies that rely on each other for inputs uh, and whose outputs are needed uh, for after a disaster. Okay, then the last slide here on um, process vulnerabilities is this, are these financial uh, vulnerabilities, which we mentioned, yeah, this is, it's, it's big, it's a problem everywhere, it's a, pro I mean, it's, it's a huge there's a problem everywhere, more in some places than others, whether it's just not enough money to make upgrades on your infrastructure, to do training. Um, and the causes for that could be, you know, low rates of customer bill collection. Maybe there's, just, you know, not recovering enough or not bringing in enough money for one reason or another. Okay, so uh, so then, so key takeaways, um, there's all sorts of many, many vulnerabilities that can impact your power sector. I've given some examples here. We've put them into two categories, infrastructure and process vulnerabilities. Uh, those infrastructure vulnerabilities are typically about things that are built. Maybe they're easier, easier to fix. At least the solutions are easier to think about, uh, but they might be more costly. Uh, and then these process vulnerabilities, uh, they're more difficult a lot of times because you're dealing with people and that's a, that's sometimes a lot harder of a problem to solve, um, but they might be less expensive, uh, but more difficult there. Okay, so we're uh, looking at the time here. We're, we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I've given a lot of examples here of of certain vulnerabilities that maybe affect Haiti, maybe they don't. Um, we, um, because we're short on time, we might not have 
a lot of, we might not have enough time to do this, but so what I'll do is say, sure, if you want to start typing some, some vulnerabilities into the chat, that's great, that's super. Uh, if not, I'll give that to you as, uh, as your homework assignment for next time. Uh, come, up with, come up with a list of five vulnerabilities uh, that, you th that you think are especially impact the power system in Haiti. Uh, now, I'm sure you can think of more, um, but try to choose five, choose some infrastructure vulnerabilities, choose some process vulnerabilities, um, and be as specific as possible. I think um, the more detail you can, you can think about or the more detail you can provide when talking about the vulnerabilities, uh, the better, and, the, and it helps you come up with better solutions. So. Uh, so maybe we'll get some answers in the chat now. Otherwise, we'll start next workshop with this, and we'll start by uh, by listing out some vulnerabilities that particularly impact Haiti's power system. Cool, and I see a couple a couple coming in here. Old infrastructures showing up. The billing system. It's a good process vulnerability, good operations vulnerability, and financial vulnerability, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you, James. I also was I was thinking um, for the for the next session, uh, if folks want to hold a little extra time at the at the end, you know, we will try and and stay on um, since it is the last session to. To a little bit longer, maybe 15 minutes or a half hour longer. We'll try and make ourselves available to answer questions or do any wrap up um, so that we have a little more flexibility uh, on the back end of the next session. Yeah, and the next section, uh, we, want, we are planning to be a lot more interactive. Uh, it'll be group activities most of the time, not so many slides. Um, but, but yeah, we're happy to yeah, happy to stay on for 15, 15, 30 extra minutes. All right then, yep, so thanks. Yep, I'm seeing some good vulnerabilities coming in in the chat. Um, yeah, we'll, we will review some of these. Yeah, we'll review some of these next time. And again, our next workshop is going to be on uh, assessing risks and prioritizing some solutions here. So we'll take the threats that we talked about last week, some of the vulnerabilities we talked about uh, today, look at where those overlap, and then which uh, which comp which threats might expose vulnerabilities uh, that are the most important to address, or which will be the what are the biggest risks really. When those threats might expose vulnerabilities, uh, so that's a that's the uh, the topic for next time. And hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully you can all make it because we want to get a lot of a lot of involvement and interaction next time. So, otherwise, uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. Many many thanks for the translators, uh, and we'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you, everyone.